Ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends of MIT, welcome to the second webinar of MIT IOP Digital Transformation Series. Digital transformation is a phrase we hear often these days. Leaders across industries are adopting digital transformation strategies and innovative solutions to improve the way we work and live. As enabler, digital transformation combines strategy and the smart technologies to enable company to remain competitive in this rapid changing marketplace. In 2019, close to about $2 trillion was spent on digital technology such as cloud, data, voice, video, and internet of things. But still many challenges persist. As more than two thirds of these digital transformation projects did not achieve the goals. I'm honored today to introduce two wonderful speakers from MIT to help us address some of these pressing challenges. Our first speaker, Jean, Jeannie Ross, is a principal research scientist at MIT Center for Information System Research, where for 25 years, she has studied the strategic use of computing technologies and data. Her particular expertise is around architecture, specifically the design of people processes and technologies to enable execution of business strategies. Last fall, she co-authored her fourth book, Designed for Digital, How to Architecture Your Business for Sustained Success, which is helping companies transforming for the digital economy. She has helped bring architecture into strategic dis discussions at various companies, including Aetna, PepsiCo, Schneider Elect Electronic, China Mobile, and the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Today, Jeannie will speak to us on the topic, the digital challenge, how to transform your business in the midst of a crisis. With that, please help me welcoming Jeannie Ross. Thank you. Thank you, David. It's great to be here, and I want to thank the M M M MIT ILP for inviting us to share our scissor research on digital design. Did you, let me just start by sharing with you uh, my presentation here. Digital technologies are creating transparency into what does and doesn't work inside your company. You can't survive on hard work and some combination of hope or luck. You'll have to design a seamless company that learns and responds to constantly changing customer demands. By the time our book came out last fall, it was clear that there would be winners and losers in this digital economy. What we didn't know last fall was the extent to which a global pandemic would accelerate the emergence of those winners and losers. Addressing the opportunities and challenges of digital has become truly urgent. In this session, my co-author, Cynthia Beath, will join me to share with you what we've learned about how you position your company for success. Please ask questions at any point through the chat feature. Cynthia will be monitoring the, the chat, and, and she'll be uh, interjecting questions as they come in. Let me start by simply introducing MIT Scissor. The Center for Information Systems Research is a group of 90 companies that are all interested in understanding how companies will deliver success from information technology. And we are indebted to these sponsors for their support of our research, for their willingness to discuss their ideas and their experiences with us, and for giving us feedback on what actually works and doesn't work. It's made the Center for Information Systems Research a vibrant, uh, econ uh, a vibrant community within MIT. Now, the particular challenge we want to explore here is what's happening as a result of digital technologies. We've been studying for years now the introduction of technologies like social, mobile, analytics, cloud, the Internet of Things. We call this smack it. And here's what you need to understand about Smack It. It is changing what's possible. And why we care about this is because it's not just Smack It,
but this constant introduction of new technologies, add artificial intelligence, blockchain, biometrics, robotics, quantum computing, they just keep coming. And they are changing what's possible in business in ways that Uber made so evident when it said, people don't just want a ride in a car. They want an information enriched travel experience. They want a solution to their transportation needs. This is what digital is doing to business. Now, the good news is you do not have to understand every new technology and what it makes possible as it arrives on the scene. What you can do is simply recognize that technology has gone from an enabler to a source of inspiration for your business strategy. We suggest that you allow yourself to be inspired by three capabilities that extend across all these digital technologies. The first is ubiquitous data. There is basically nothing you can't know now. The data is out there. You're looking for ways to find it and use it. So stop thinking of data as a limitation and think of all it makes possible. Then find the way to get the data and to get permission to use that data. The second capability is unlimited connectivity. Particularly IoT and mobile are making it possible to learn things immediately and then do something about them immediately. We have to recognize what that uh, connectivity means in terms of what we need to be delivering and imagining for our customers. Finally, there's massive processing power. There is no limit to how much data you can process. So what you can imagine, you can do. That is the challenge of digital. Now, what's interesting to us is that as we study the possibilities here, it became clear that companies were indeed responding. They were not all doing so in the same way. They, in fact, didn't mean the same thing when they told us they were digitally transforming. What we went out to study then is, well, what is a digital transformation? And what you need to understand about what we learned is that there's actually two pieces of this. And even now, when everybody's working from home and people are saying to us, well, we just became digital, not so fast. Working from home under duress is not the same as being a digital company. There are two ways of thinking about this transformation. The first is that it leads to digitization. This is about operational excellence. This is about end-to-end -end delivery, doing things for your customers in ways that simply work, regardless of channel. So they can call you on the phone, they can chat with you on the internet, they can do things for themselves through an app, but the idea is you are operationally excellent and thus you can anticipate your needs, you can address their needs as they arrive. You do better what you have always done. You deliver traditional products and services, but you deliver them at a level that was not possible before. We call that digitizing. And the reason this is important is because digital technologies are raising the bar. You really must be digitized. But that is only half the story. The other half of the story is becoming digital. This is about rapid business innovation. It involves delivering brand new customer value propositions. These are the solutions that Uber has made so visible. What problems can you solve for your customers that you never considered part of your mandate before. Move beyond your traditional products and services and solve your customers' problems. That is the challenge of digital. Digitizing, getting better and better at what you've always done, 
and becoming digital, delivering brand new customer solutions. Now, I think this is a good time to just learn a little about the companies out in our audience. So we're going to ask a polling question here. We'd like to know what digital transformation means to your company. Is it digitizing, becoming more operationally excellent at what you've always done? Or is it about digital, delivering rapid business innovation? Or is it neither or both? What is digital to your company? Can we have the polling question, please? So if you'll pick one of those options, digitized only, digital only, neither or both, we'll get a sense of what's going on here. There we go. Ah, so as you can see, the majority of companies in our uh, uh, webinar here are trying to do both. It doesn't get much harder than that. I appreciate the importance of digitized only, and if you have the luxury of time, uh, that's not a bad way to go. So um, glad to see that uh, you're all working so hard, uh, trying to make progress. Let's talk about these two things then that so many of you are trying to do. Here's your challenge. It turns out, that for the last, oh, 30 or 40 years, we have been using information technology to support our organizational processes. The problem is we did it little bit by little bit. And as a result, we ended up with a lot of siloed systems that address one very specific business need. I'm showing five of those very specific needs that were addressed by a system and an accompanying process and the data it generated, the technology it relied on. This is five. We've talked with many companies that would say, yeah, we have about 2,000 of those. And this is what we created. The problem, of course, was, is that while it made sense at the time this new system was created, having hundreds or thousands of these siloed systems eventually created more and more demands to connect them. People would go to their IT units and they'd say, well, can't you make that system, talk to that system, or share that data with that data? And so we got all these wires I'm showing in here. Sometimes they were, in fact, things the IT unit did. Sometimes they were people downloading things into spreadsheets. Sometimes they were just heroes in your company that would see something going wrong and they would go out and take care of it. But it doesn't matter how you solve that problem. The solution itself was also a problem. And now what we have is this mess of spaghetti. This is what we're trying to fix right now as we digitize, because we are indeed exposing all this spaghetti to our customers. So we're trying to create something that looks more like this, a platform. We call it an operational backbone. This is what digitizing is all about. It takes our core operations and it says we can expose them to customers because they work end to end. They allow us to complete transactions, to get visibility into those transactions, to do all the back office stuff that needs to get done, and it simply works. So this operational backbone is that set of standardized business processes that supports your, your core transactions and, and your core back office processes in a seamless way. And, and that allows you to add front ends like apps and, and browser uh, interfaces with your customers. This is a digital platform, or an operational plat uh, backbone. Not everything you do is part of your operational backbone. That's fine. But core is, this is what allows seamlessness, and visibility to your customers. Now, this is really important. I just want to describe to you one example of a company that kind of gets it, and that would be Nordstrom. We started studying Nordstrom about five years ago because they were so tuned into what it was going to take to succeed as a retailer in a digital world. 
Their business strategy was to recognize that some of their customers, if any of you don't know Nordstrom, this is a high-end retailer, mostly clothing. Uh, and for 100 years, the company was retail stores. Uh, but what it started doing oh, more than uh, 10 years ago now was recognizing not everybody would want to go into a high-end retail store. Some people would want to do things online. Some people would want to do things uh, at a discount. So uh, for years now, it has been creating its, its rack stores, which are off price. It's creating uh, Nordstrom.com and, and allowing customers to do things online. But around 2015, it actually shared with its investors this vision of becoming a digitized company. And what it pursued at that point was a set of capabilities that would allow a customer to use all of its outlets. It's off price, it's full price, it's online, it's in store. And it said, what we're going to do is continue to specialize in service. We are known for customer service. We're going to get better and better at customer service. We're going to create digital capabilities to support our people who are supporting our customers. But we're also going to allow customers to do things for themselves. So they emphasized the customer service element of this. They took a serious look at their product. But this last piece, the capabilities piece, was about ensuring that technology could service their employees and their customers. And this really paid off. It, this goes all the way back to 1998 when they created Nordstrom.com, which at the time, of course, it, like everybody's, was kind of a static page. But they, they started to build capabilities into Nordstrom.com so people could order online, so that they could uh, take advantage of a back end where they could do store-to-store -store fulfill. The critical capability that Nordstrom developed was actually a transparent supply chain. And this is a company that said the most important thing is customer service. But when it looked at its operational backbone, it said more than anything, we need a transparent supply chain. And as it's creating Nordstrom.com, as it's building capability at, that is online, it's taking advantage of that transparent supply chain to do store-to-store -store fulfill, to allow you to pick up one place and drop off uh, somewhere else. Uh, it creates the international shipping online. By 2011, Nordstrom is saying, we can really see the capabilities of digital here. So they created an app their iPhone app, one of the first stores to do this. But not only could you use an app, by 2012, they, were ha they had mobile checkout. They had people in their stores saying, let's take advantage of mobility in the store. By 2013, they're saying, not only should we use Nordstrom technology, we should use these public technologies like Pinterest and encourage our salespeople to post things. And of course, our customers will naturally do that. In 2014, they're recognizing the opportunities in sell to buy, uh, Instagram. Uh, this continued to build, but we kind of cut off the story here because what we found with Nordstrom is it continued to focus on the digitizing. The digital is still part of its challenge. Nonetheless, Nordstrom's digitizing efforts have positioned them to be stronger in this pandemic than any other department store. New, the New York Times just ran an article in which it says Nordstrom's is the one retailer, uh, department store retailer, that should be able to survive, say, a year-long global pandemic, this kind of economy. So the digitizing is really paying off. Now, this is still the digitizing piece. And what we're emphasizing here is you're going to go from business silos to an operational backbone that enhances how you have traditionally conducted business and allows you to start adding these digital technologies to enhance those capabilities at the customer and employee interface. Here's the bad news. When we went out and studied this, what we learned 
is that only 14% of established companies actually had a robust operational backbone. There's another 30% that have made enough progress that it's not necessarily impeding them as they become digital, but this is the state of the art. A real, real uh, liability for many companies in this digital world is, a, is the lack of an operational backbone, the inability to do things end-to-end -end and reliably for their customers. This, I think, is a good point at which to bring in Cynthia. Hi. Hello, Cynthia. Thank you for joining us. Cynthia and I have been doing research together for about 30 years now, so we kind of know what one another are thinking, but I always like to hear what she's thinking anyway. Cynthia, uh, any questions on, on the operational backbone? Yes. Mohammed has asked, and uh, this has been voted up by several people, who should lead the digitization efforts? Line functions or a specialized department? I'm interested in your thoughts on this too, Cynthia, but I'll start by saying what we have found, whether or not it is ideal, is that this is typically led by the CIO. The problem, of course, is that why the CIO can help uh, shape the vision, uh, can provide the underlying technology, the CIO cannot impose the discipline in the organization that creates this, this digital, this operational backbone. So uh, it can be headed by uh, the CIO, but it, it can't be accomplished by the CIO. What's your take on that, Cynthia? Yeah, I would agree. This is an enterprise effort. And um, while the, the CIO might be running the show or orchestrating what is happening, the decisions that are involved and what should be uh, standardized and what should not, and which, which elements of the or operational backbone should be replaced and at what cost, that's an enterprise question. So I would say the line functions as a whole need to own this transition. So I have, a, I have another interesting question, Jeannie. Somebody, Jim asked, what's the difference between the operational backbone and Porter's value chain? Well, um, <laughs> I, I think there's a, there's a nice correlation there, right? If you understand yeah. your value chain, you can start to identify what has to be the essence of this operational backbone. Because one problem we've seen is companies uh, pursue these massive ERP implementations that never get finished. And I think if you understand your value chain and what matters most, it can help you get past that, you gotta fix everything, to there are most important things. And the, the trick to getting an operational backbone in is to not try to do everything, but to recognize some really critical things and go after them. What's your thought? Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. It, uh, the, the value chain is essentially those, we think of those as those separate silos. And the spaghetti lines between the separate silos are essentially the ways in which the value chain actually must be connected, right? It's data that has to pass along the value chain. And so I think uh, the operational backbone is what allows you to do that in a sensible, efficient, correct way. So. There yeah, are a no, number of other questions. Do you want more questions or do you want to move ahead? Let's, let's do one more and then I suppose we'll save the rest for the end. Okay, so I think this is a, an interesting one. Uh, Gerald says, um, I understand shared uh, data platform and shared technology, but can you give us some examples of how processes and applications can be shared by different groups or functions? Different. Okay, you, I'll take a shot at that. Yeah, take a shot <laughs> first. I'll respond to your reaction. I will at least take the applications. And essentially, um, whether or not data is shared um, is often best instantiated by sharing the application, right? So that shared applications <laughs> gives you data that is consistent and shared. So that would be the first one. And then processes. 
processes are often shared, some processes are shared across different parts of the business in the sense that they have to link together. So they have to be designed in a way that they link or they can be replicated or duplicated across similar parts of the business where you're doing the same activity in different countries or in different locations or with different type, different kinds of products. So uh, yeah. shared processes can ensure that the data uh, that comes from those processes is in fact true. Yeah, that's a great point because I know um, a lot of companies would like to solve their data issues with better governance. And I do not want to discourage good governance. I think it's really, really important. But if we're saying we're, we can govern this all and then we'll get buy-in and people will do it, I just don't think we're being realistic about what life is like in a complex organization. If we don't have established process and systems that guide that process, our best intentions will never be realized. Uh, we need those systems and processes to ensure that the, the right data is captured and that it's used appropriately. So I, I think that, that really is the essence of the, of the shared application. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one thing that Cynthia and I talk a lot about is this operational backbone is essential. We, we call it here in, in this slide, table stakes. And to be honest, we do not know how you become a great digital company if your core operations are broken. You have to fix them. And this is why we consider this data on the relative uh, dearth of uh, uh, operational backbones to be alarming. Uh, this, this could sink you in, in your efforts. So it's important to get started. Uh, you can do that by not trying to boil the ocean, but by finding the most important data, the most important process, and fix it. Do something that will make a difference in three months, even though fully realizing what you're trying to do will certainly take longer. These uh, operational backbones are, are challenges that have been created through years and years and years of processes and systems that need to slowly be fixed. Uh, so focus on the most important, do something substantive, and then start to use it, and, uh, and, then, and the job will never be done. You'll continue that journey for a long, long time. But that is only half the story. In addition to digitizing, you have to become digital because your customers are demanding so much more. You need to start solving their problems. Now, to do that, you have to think of, their, of your new value proposition. What is it a customer wants from you? This will manifest in digital offering. A digital offering you'll see here is an information-enriched solution that engages customers in a seamless, personalized experience. It has to be information enriched because it has to take advantage of these new digital technologies, uh, the, the data that's uh, available to them and the speed and connectivity that they make possible. But it also has to be seamless and personalized because otherwise somebody else is gonna come along and take your great idea and do it better. Now this graphic is probably the single most important graphic in this presentation. And it looks ridiculously simple, but it's incredibly hard. There are two things going on here. One is you're trying to be inspired by what digital technologies make possible. And the thing is, they make a lot of things possible. MIT students come to me every day with things that digital technologies are making possible. Here's the problem. Nobody wants to pay for most of them. And if nobody wants to pay for them, it's not really that brilliant. Now, your risk here is you're going to think you're some kind of Steve Jobs and you know better than your customer what they want. Do not make that mistake. You do not know better than your customer what they want, even if it's true that your customer doesn't know what they want. And that probably is true. But you and your customer are going to learn together what your customer wants. I think the GE experience here is sobering. This is, I mean, the industrial internet, which is what GE envisioned, 
was a brilliant concept. It was brilliant. The problem was, after the company had spent uh, several years and a billion dollars developing it, it then took it to customers and they went, you know, that's not quite what I had in mind. And, and we can't do that. We can't invest huge sums in a solution that the customer isn't bought into, even if it's good for them. So the other half of this picture is what your customer desires. Now, you can influence that. You can market. You can test with them. This idea of ongoing testing of, let me try this with you. Wouldn't you be interested in this? Here's something that you might like. Amazon, of course, does this all the time, and we're all jealous because they have such huge volume. They can test things all the time. But every company can identify what's possible and test it with real customers, and it is the only way to learn. We have to understand we do not know what our customers want. So these two pieces come together day in and day out by trying things and learning and working hand in glove with our customers. That is the challenge of digital. Now, I want to share with you three companies that kind of get it. I'll start with Amazon because we all know Amazon. You might think they're not really fair because they didn't start as a digital company, but here's the interesting thing. Um, they are not a digital startup. They were born in the 1990s before digital technologies were available. They were born as an online book retailer. You could order a book through an email interface and they would ship it to you. So what happened is that Amazon has continuously been inspired by technology. When it saw that um, robotics was possible, it got better and better at warehouse management to where it didn't have to restrict itself to books. When it saw the possibilities of social media, it said, why are we paying people to write a few book reviews why don't we have everybody writing reviews and let people pick and choose which reviews they find valuable? When they saw the, the browser, uh, that was the initial manifestation of moving from an email retailer to an online company that had invented the shopping cart, a, an online virtual shopping experience. Now, uh, as you know, Amazon is inspired by artificial intelligence and better data analytics that help recognize how to re recommend products to you and help you decide what it is you want to buy. This is a company that's been inspired. One of its digital offerings is Prime. Now, this is like the digital offering of all digital offerings. Most of you are probably customers, probably uh, pay for Prime every year. Do you even know what you pay for Prime? Do you fully understand all the benefits of Prime? Probably not. But do you ever say, eh, do I want to spend the money this year? Probably not. That is the kind of digital offering we all aspire to. We can't, your customer cannot live without it. That is what we can do with a great digital offering. It so solves a customer problem, it can't even imagine life without it. That's your challenge as you formulate your digital offering. Now, let me take uh, an older company. Schneider Electric's been around for well over 100 years, and what it did for most of those 100 years was sell electrical equipment, engineer and sell electrical equipment. And what this does is it enables you as a, a builder to, to buy things from Schneider and you can buy everything soup to nuts. You can buy big transformers and switchboards. You can buy the control panel that regulates your temperature. You can buy cords and, and outlets. It's, it's soup to nuts. It's, it's all electrical equipment. But what Schneider started to recognize a number of years ago was that with the big equipment, it's good to have alerts if they're failing, if, they, if too much is being demanded of them and they, they no longer have the capacity. And what they were doing was alerting the customer and the salesperson to basically stimulate a new sale. But that 
recognition that that worked created additional ideas and the opportunity for additional services. What Schneider does now is it creates intelligent energy management solutions. This means that they help you recognize how to source energy. They tell you if you're at risk of having a brown up. They tell you if something's dying. Uh, they're looking for ways for you to save money as you provide the energy needs of your business. It started with uh, energy needs for companies like Hilton Hotels, who are trying to manage all of the uh, energy requirements for their hotels. But they've also done this for data centers, for office space. They help you, through the use of a dashboard, understand how you can provide reliable, cost-effective energy for your company. What they now sell is what they call ecostructure. That's their underlying base for delivering energy solutions to your company. And they, they have multiple offerings depending on your particular industry. Now, the third example is CarMax. CarMax is a, a, a used car retailer. And it started by just recognizing that buying a used car tends to be a horrible experience. But as they did this, they started looking at all the possibilities that online made possible. And, and they added browser and, and, and to a large extent apps as well. And they created not just the retail experience, but an omni-channel experience. You can go shopping for a long time viewing all of CarMax's cars before you ever walk into a store. And in fact, if you'd rather never walk into a store, CarMax is now developing what it calls home delivery. Home delivery means if you really are confident that's the car you want, you can tell from the pictures, you can tell from your research, you just want it, they'll just bring it to you. Interestingly, this was in an experimental phase earlier this year. The pandemic has kind of accelerated what's going on. But this is positioning yourself to deliver new solutions to your customers. And that is what customer insights are all about. The digital offering is a response to your understanding of what's possible and what your customers want. Let me bring Cynthia back in here, to ask if there are any questions about these customer insights and digital offerings. Um, Claudia asks, what if, you, what if your customers don't know what they want or need? The customers may not be that innovative and they may not recognize new opportunities. This is a great question, and it's almost certain to be your experience. The, the funny experience that Schneider had was that they were developing these amazing solutions for their customers, but when they went to their customers and they started by seeking out their 24 biggest, best customers, they knock on the door and say, guess what we could do for you? 24 of their best 24 customers went, eh, I don't think so. And, and they really, really had to work to get any of them to say, all right, we'll try it. And then they had one, right? And so they work with one to get one amazing solution. And they have to work just as hard for the second one. But as you might expect, you get the first through a lot of work, the second through a lot of work. It shapes it. It helps you develop a better and better understanding of what you can do. You make a better plug to the third customer, and it starts to build. So Schneider now is on a roll. Uh, it started seven years ago. Let's, let's be clear about that. In fact, they, they say it's a little hard to pick the exact date when they started. They've been at this a while, but they are now on a roll. They, the customers come to them. They ask for things that Schneider says, whoa, that may be a bit beyond what we do. Uh, we'll go find a partner that, that can provide some of these services. So they're growing not only with what they can do, but with what their partners can do. And, and that is the path. I, I, recognizing that that's a challenge, I think, is, is step number one. But this is about persistence and, and constantly looking for what you can learn from your customers. You want to add anything to that, Cynthia? 
Yeah, I would just say that um, in the end, your offering has to be something the customer wants. And so it's, it's even more important that you work with the customers to define those offerings and make sure that they fit well with the customer's own processes and the, with what the customer is trying to accomplish. So in the end, regardless of how you get there, it has to work for the customer. Yeah. Okay. So We've got about 15 minutes. Okay, so we'll move on, and if there's more questions, we'll uh, look at those at the end, is that they do require technology, but for most cases, this is new. This is about a software solution that enriches your traditional products and services. So you'll want to build these software components in an entirely new environment, in what we call the digital platform. This digital platform is reusable components. Some of these are business components. At Schneider, for example, they had to learn how to do subscription billing. This subscription billing was brand new. They never did that before. They built it as a reusable component. So as they're adding new solutions, they can reuse it or tweak it. They can take part of it and not the rest of it. But they don't have to change their entire operational backbone where transactions are normally completed. They also had to create dashboards. That's a reusable component, even though these dashboards are customized. But there are a lot of algorithms that go into those. Uh, there's asset management. We have to make sure that we're collecting all the data from one of our customers' equipment and none of the data from other uh, customers' is entering into the assessment of one customer's needs. So this identity management, asset management becomes really important. That kind of uh, capability gets built into infrastructure services, many of which are purchased through, through vendors at cloud services. Some of them are data components that become available by buying, by collecting data from IoT, uh, by borrowing data from their uh, customer uh, backbone. Um, those, those data components then serve these business components. And the digital offerings at the top of this picture are the unique code. For each offering, we have unique code that accesses the reusable components and delivers an actual solution to an actual customer. It's unclear how many of these you might have, but that number can grow and grow because the components themselves are well-defined for reuse in what the company has decided is its value proposition to customers. Now, here's the story on the digital platform. Two years ago, when we asked how many of you have digital platforms, only 5% of established companies had platforms. But it started to create repositories of digital components. The good news is we don't have a horrible legacy here. So as we start doing it, it may be small, but that platform grows rapidly. I am very confident that this data we collected two years ago is out of date now. This would be significantly different, unlike the operational backbone where that data is moving very slowly. So here we see uh, new companies recognizing the importance of digital platforms and starting to build them. But this is what it takes to create digital offerings. Now, understand what this means for any existing company is that you're going to need two technology environments. One is this digital platform where you're creating these reusable components that build your solutions. They, they allow for rapid development. They allow you to say, oops, that's not working, and get rid of things really quickly. That's your digital platform. You still need this operational backbone. That's how you know your customers. It's how your uh, back office processes work. That's your supply chain for your physical products and services. It's really important. These two platforms do tend to rely on one another for data. We have identified the most progressive companies as doing a remarkable job of allowing people to operate in one environment or the other, and then having a small technology team in between 
managing what we call the API linkages. You might call it the middleware. You might call it the data that needs to be exchanged. This is how these two environments can coexist. They allow you, for all you who said we're doing both right now, digitizing and digital, if you've separated responsibility and you have some parts of the business, probably the bigger part of the business on the operational backbone, other people can start working on those digital offerings in the digital platform. So this is the environment that we think you need to create. I know we don't have a lot of time, Cynthia, but if there's a question or two, we could actually manage a question or, uh, about this um, double technology platform. Here's your problem. Four years, if you're a company of any size at all, when you wanted to accomplish something, you turned to structure. You said, well, we'll create a new business unit, or we'll insert a new line of management, or we'll do, do this matrix that goes across the silos that we've created. We structured. The problem is structure stabilizes. And we are in a world in which our digital offerings are unpredictable. We have to be identifying and responding to emerging customer needs. We all know our customers don't know what they want. We're going to try to help them figure that out and then simultaneously deliver. We're not going to do it with a matrixed hierarchy of a company. Too slow. What we'll do instead is something like this. Um, this image is from Spotify. It's uh, widely circulated on the web, so I thought I would use it. It is old. It's from 2012. So I'm pretty sure Spotify would say, well, we don't quite look like that anymore. And the reason they wouldn't look like that is because what we've learned about these environments is they change rapidly. You learn something, you adapt. Your customer needs change, you adapt. You, you find a new opportunity, you adapt. So how you design your company is constantly evolving. It's a learning process. What works? But the idea is you are relying on empowered teams. You're distributing, you're distributing decision-making so people can get stuff done. And they can learn from what they get done and they can build on it or trash it depending on what they learn. That is the single hardest part. All the other stuff is hard. This is the single hardest part. Usually the first team isn't so hard. Even the second team isn't so bad. It's when you get to three, four, or five that you start to realize this is actually pretty hard because we want everybody empowered, but we don't want them all just going rogue and doing whatever strikes them as a good idea. That is a good way to waste money. Uh, so what we're looking for is continuous learning about how we're going to get better and better and better. In this Spotify picture, you'll see they started, they moved from just some teams to tribes. Uh, they would have a tribe that was responsible for free radio. They'd have a tribe that's responsible for core infrastructure. So they have multiple tribes that actually do have some interdependencies. And the important thing is that the tribes recognize their interdependencies and respond to one another's needs. This is why they have things like guilds and chapters that work across teams and across tribes. That's the challenge you'll take on as you start to use empowered people and teams to ensure you're learning and responding to new customer demands. It's hard work. And it starts on the digital side of your business. Ultimately, it's also applicable to the operational backbone side, but it is so essential on the digital side that you really want to make sure you're trying it here and then implementing it as you can on the operational backbone side. I would say there are eight principles that you're trying to get your head around here. One is, as you start to do this, you want to recognize you need people to own your major components and offerings. Get past projects where somebody says, I'll deliver something and then hand it off. You want people who are learning, doing, improving, getting rid of, uh, doing whatever needs to be done so that some offering to a customer gets better and better and better and richer and richer. If it gets too big, it'll become two offerings and you'll have 
more owners, uh, only different parts of those offerings. The second thing to recognize is you are trying to get rid of structure as you're organizing logic. Let me be clear, there will be structure, but it should follow, not lead. The thing that leads is mission. What am I trying to get done here? How do I assign some talent, some energy, some resources to a mission that somebody and somebody's team can pursue? Those teams are driven by metrics. They understand the mission. They establish some metrics that will help them understand if they're succeeding. This is not about the boss telling them what to do. This is about them imagining what they can pull off. So what they do then is create experiments to see if they can, in fact, achieve the uh, mission by zeroing in on the metrics that they've identified, certainly in conjunction with, with management, that would deliver to the needs of the company. Now, what this means is you have to be able to continuously release. This is a new technology environment, and it's why you are likely to do this on the digital side before you get around to the digitized side. This is about what we call DevOps. It's, a, it's an, a, an environment in which people are empowered to put their code into production. And you need a well-designed infrastructure for that. So doing this for your digital offerings, which will be much smaller initially, makes a lot of sense. You can eventually go back and make sure this happens with your digitized side. Then you have to understand that this is not the cheapest organizational design. You have to resource it. Otherwise, you have people waiting for stuff. It's like you've been waiting for approvals in your hierarchical, hierarchical environment. You're going to end up having this uh, uh, waiting time while you, people are waiting for people to get stuff done. You rely on collaboration, not hierarchy, to ensure that people get stuff done. And you make sure that leaders trust the decision makers. If you empower people, but you don't trust their decisions, you have not really empowered them. This is about assigning accountability. You tell someone you trust them, that they can deliver. You're constantly working with them to clarify what it is their, their mission should accomplish. You're challenging their ideas. You're testing why they want to pursue a certain experiment. This is about learning to coach instead of direct. Uh, this is hard. And people tell us the hard part is not the empowered team part. You'll find people perfectly capable there. It's the next layer up. People who are capable of coaching, of moving talent, of identifying missions that are really clear. That, that is the real challenge here. And it is why this is even harder than the technology environments you're trying to create. So let's stop here for our second polling question. We need to do this real quickly. So if you can bring that question up. When you look at this, these principles for accountability and the need to empower, what would you say is true of your company? What percentage has been designed for accountability rather than structured for delegated activities? Is it less than 10%, 11 to 25, 26 to 50, more than 50? Can I ask you all to go ahead and fill that in? Pick one of those choices. Now let's go ahead and look at the um, results here. Oh, they're all over. This is very interesting. So we have slightly more in the 11 to 25, apparently, but they're close. Um, so you can see uh, some companies just getting started, some having been at this a while. Those might be smaller companies. Um, I, I'm not able to ask, but that is, that's our pursuit. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to run our companies through empowerment. So let me wrap up now by giving you the really bad news. <laughs> so it's not that this is hard. Of course it's hard, uh, but you're all up for that. The thing is, it's slow. There is so much learning as you learn to assign accountabilities, as you learn to build a digital platform, as you learn what your customers want, that what we've observed from the companies we've studied is there's no way to become digital rapidly. 
you'll see that the hypothetical we've grown here is that, well, if your, dig if your revenues, your traditional revenues are, are over time going to diminish, which is true for a lot of companies. The good news is you'll have these digital revenues coming in, the orange line here. But uh, it takes a number of years to go from zero to something substantive. On average, 5% of a company's revenues, and we're talking companies that have digital offerings. They, the report we got is on average, 5% of their revenues are from those digital offerings. That's slow. And it's not going to change overnight unless, of course, that's exactly the impact a pandemic has. We'll be studying that. Um, what we have learned is you're going to have to allow some time for learning. And I don't have time to cover this in this particular um, webinar, but in our book, we describe five building blocks that help you accumulate the learning to create, deliver, and benefit from digital offerings. So I'll end by just putting up that website and, and, and encouraging you to take a deeper look. Um, do we have time for one last question, Cynthia? Um, 